Thank you for tuning into Healing Rays. In this video, we continue discussing Glenn Lowry and John McWhorter's video about the Harriet Tubman statue that was awarded to a white artist. Can white artists create monuments to the Black experience in a way that's impactful and authentic? And are Black Americans who say no to that question just too attached to a victimhood narrative, as McWhorter suggests they are? I start the video by asking Andre how he would feel about a white artist winning this kind of commission if it was evaluated in a race-blind way by a group that included ample Black judges. Let's get to that conversation now. Enjoy. If there was a process, let's say that this process, and again, I don't know what they did in Philadelphia, but let's say that this process was that people anonymously submit ideas for creations of this statue and that the people making the decision were some sort of well-rounded, including ample participation from Black members of Philadelphia, um, had to come together and critique, discuss, decide on which one most represented what they wanted to get across about the story of Harriet Tubman, right? Yeah. And, and that what struck people was one that was created by a white person. So I disagree. So I'm going to stop you right here because I already disagree with your premise when What's you the use premise? the word anonymous, because anonymous would not have been my process. I would have gone to Black artists and say, y'all know what? We are creating this statue to honor the life of Harriet Tubman. And I want you as Black people to understand her life and submit and submit your ideas for what this monument should look like. I want to see, because and the reason it would not have been anonymous in Andre's world, meaning if Andre was running shit, the reason it would not have been anonymous, anonymous because I want a deliberate continuity to what she was, the acts that she committed and the people who created that statue. Mm -hmm. You mean a connection, the continuity is between what and what, sorry. The between. continuity of the black people she was delivering into freedom and the free free black people that designed that monument. Mm -hmm. Okay, so for you, the process would have been, because you talked Not about- anonymous. <laughs> Well, it wouldn't have only been anonymous. You essentially would have said only Black people apply. Pretty much. Yeah. And so that would have been... Now, why is that continuity in, important to you? Because of what it symbolizes. What does it symbolize? Because it's... What does it symbolize? You tell me. You're the people of the Book of Exodus. What does it symbolize to you? It symbolizes deliverance. So to you... We are that future that you, we are that future she was dreaming of. The fact that I can sit here on this, this technology would just blow anybody's mind from yesteryear. But the fact we can sit here on these computers and argue with one another <laughs> and do it in a civil fashion and whatnot. There, yeah. was, a, there was a day, so Todd, let, let me help you. Let, let me work with you, baby. There was a, the way I talked to you, there was a day people would have knocked my teeth out talking to a white man like that. Yeah. You know, that is not lost on me, which is part of the reason why I do it. You people out there in YouTube land <laughs> they exercise my freedom to tell off white folks because we are free to do that and don't ever take that freedom for granted. But so That's number one. Number two, number two, I just feel that sense of deliverance is important because it's almost in the African-American story and in our evolutions to see, look how far we come, we've come. We don't have now true enough. There are people still deliberately targeting us in, in harmful ways because we're Black. But it is to a lesser extent, the motivation is the same, but it's to a lesser extent. And we are relatively able to live free lives vis-a-vis -vis our ancestors. Almost like Michaela said on how to get away with murder. She said, I am my ancestor's wildest dream. Right. And in some ways, we we really, really are, you know, and in some ways we're 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 building the dream for even the generations coming after us. And I want and it just seems so personal to me for that continuity of deliverance. We've now we're living in the environment she was trying to deliver those people into for to have that 
monument done by an African-American artist. So for me, it's an emotional one of bringing the story, you know, I guess you would say 360. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's, that's, that's compelling to me. I, I can understand that the very act of, of a black artist creating it is, is actually part of the story um, in this, in this particular case, I can, I can see that as being a compelling, meaningful kind of backstory in the future when people see this statue um, to, to kind but, of- and, But and also my, what I'm saying is that backstory does not take away from anyone who is not African-American gleaning a sense of inspiration or light from the life in the acts of Harriet Tubman. So I'm saying the two can exist together. Uh, yeah, the two can can exist together. I have a couple. You're not mutually exclusive. So you said you said it, it depends on what the art is. So this is you know you're telling a and yeah, of, I do think it depends on the medium. Yeah, not yeah, not just the medium, but the story itself. And and, and Harriet, yeah. Tubman's, Harriet Tubman's story is about the story of freedom, right? And so and American bravery and American bravery. And I particularly I want black people to look at that and to say, you know what, the same way because I guess this is what I see it when I know the life of Harriet Tubman: be bold, be brave, be black. So. So let's take the examples that I brought up. Can, I mean, the story of, of Remember the Titans is a little bit different because there's actually white and black participants. Now, obviously, black participants in the forced integration were were at least theoretically getting more opportunity. There's a lot of dissecting of integration in general, but um, but at least the premise, the intention, right, is is increased opportunity. Um but there's but there's two you know there there's white people who experience the integration and connection and 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 overcoming you know differences and there's black people who, so so there's 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 multiple parts of that story um itself but I, let's say let's say that we were to to angle that story in a way that was more about the black story in that kind of a case, is it important to for a black person to kind of direct that story? In the case of the Rw Hotel Rwanda, is it important that a a Rwandan direct direct that movie? I'll like give you another consideration that's very tangible. If you know black people, you know one thing is our movie, The Color Purple, mm. that is the done by Steven Spielberg. So mm. a Jewish American told this rural Southern what has become almost like a bedrock of modern African-American culture. The Every Black woman, what's your favorite movie? The Color Purple? The Color Purple. And the yeah, remake, great example. the remake of The Color Purple, and I will be there with my little ticket, launches in December. Because I'm like, whoo, how did they update it for modern times? Yeah. Um. So on the face of it, the answer, the, and oh my God, I still well at watching The Color Purple. On the face of it, the answer to your question from me to you is yes. Because clearly Steven Spielberg did uh, did that work. Is he entrenched in that? Because I also, if you ever watched The Fablemans, which is a kind of think the the story about Steven. I haven't seen Bill. it yet, but I've heard wonderful things about it's it. It's a yeah. wonderful film. It's a wonderful film. So clearly Steven does not have a deliberate personal connection to the African American story when he grew up, <laughs> right? But yeah. he was able to tap into that common humanity of hope need and aspiration all those things that give us the feeling that we do as black people when we watch the color purple um however i will say he used superb black talent in that film so had a, should a white woman have played Celie? no then that because that would have been that would have been disjointed for us you know should yeah. oprah have not played miss sophia no <laughs> we see what all that turned into right yeah. Um, so like, I, I guess I say this to say, to harken back to what I said, it, it really depends on the context, the subject and the medium. And you know what? I think what we're really talking about is the sensitivity and the awareness of the individual. So to if you have a white soul a being, because souls don't have race, if you have a white being who has the awareness to bring respect to the subject, then I could see how the memorial would be, would be, uh, how would you say, uh, would be fine with people. But it's really up to that artist to show, to demonstrate, you're dealing with a highly charged, highly personal thing. And it's up to you to demonstrate, you know what, I understand why you would have my doubts, you have, have your doubts, and I hear what you're saying, but I do feel I have the capability to execute this 
with respect, love, and all the things, and to do justice to what you're looking for in a monument about such a great American, right? Yeah. But I, it's that artist, the, the, the onus is on the artist, not on us to say, well, we'll see. No, because you're 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 entrusting the you're entrusting the legacy of a people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what you're saying is you earn part you partially at least earn the trust by showing a proactive um motivation to 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 understand the emotionality, the 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 perspective, the yes. the experience. Um, that's one way to earn trust. It it's you know I, I feel like it's a little bit similar. You know when you asked me about my grandmother, um, I mean all, all all of this we're talking about context and understanding, right? And um, oh, well this 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 portion of the conversation, and you want to know that there's some some mechanism to show that someone cares about that, and also mm -hmm. some mechanism that someone that that ensures that they deliver on it as well yes. in the end of the day. And so, you know, the example we talked about with Eminem is you felt like Dre vouching for him, right? Yes. Was a way of saying we can trust that he's coming from the right place, you know, in in in, in creating rap, right? Yes. There's some mechanism to 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 earn that trust that there's there's an understanding of of context and 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 that there's understanding generally of the the experience that you're depicting. Um, so I, I, and that I, that I completely, that I resonate with a lot. Um, and I, and I, I, to be honest, I almost thought about it also in response to Lowry and McWhorter because McWhorter's. So first let's give, let's give Lowry credit for bringing up the employment aspect of it. He said, you know, I can understand the motivation of full, you know, full black employment, that this is an opportunity. It's an opportunity that's about a black, a black, you know, experience. Um, you know, shouldn't that opportunity be given to someone who's black given the history? So he, he said he could, at least he doesn't agree with it, but he at least could understand that argument more. So let's, let's at least give, give um you know credit to that yes of course. credit to that you know um and mccorder felt seemed to seem to understand that as well you know one of the things he said was this idea of that we're not just our our victimhood right and um Marin also expressed that to you because we don't see it as victimhood. We see it as being a bit. That's a victor. As many times as Miss Tubman came and said, no white folks kept trying to get her. That is a big baby. That's Victoria. That is totally. Victoria. So that was my reaction to what when he said that. That's no, no, I, no, no. I had the complete different reaction. I was like, you know, this is a this is someone we look up to. This is this is an, a story of triumph. Yes, it comes from American our, bravery. Some of our anger about it comes from some of the pain of the past, sure. But but I didn't get that this was a holding on to victimhood. Um, I mean, I can see a little bit of where he's coming from because he, he is saying like, is this, is this just our story? Is our story of victimhood, of, of being slaves and everything that came after it, is it just our story? It's most intimately your story, um, but he wants to say it's more than just your story. But I, I celebrate the triumph in black food. So if you ever come to my house, I cook. I <laughs> I kind of I cook the way our grandmothers used to cook: cornbread, beans, and pork chop. <laughs> I like eating that way. And I, one day I was I was having a good old plate of food. I'm like, oh, you know, this is so good. And it's what keeps me and feel connected, rooted to our past. So I celebrate African American culture in the food that I cook and the way that I cook it. Yeah. This is where I felt that there was among, and I know their points of view, I've listened to their conversations a lot. I felt like there was a an instinctive gut reaction to this. Now, I didn't see the, the, the tweets that he is responding to. I didn't see the criticism and I could be completely wrong in understanding his context. But I felt like, and, and so maybe there were people who were criticizing because it's like, it's our pain and therefore it should be our creative outlet. Maybe people were saying that. Mm. But when I heard him talk, connect this to this, this connection to eternal victimhood, as he said, this identity of eternal victimhood, I, and, and that, and he said, you know, he, he said a question, which I think is a really compelling question. Like, aren't we more than that? And I'll tell you why it's compelling for me is that he asked that question is because I see that sometimes 
I see that sometimes in the Jewish community. Oh, I know. I, your I holidays really know. are built on remembrance. Your holidays are built on remembering yeah. the suffering of the past. I'm intimated with some with Judaism. Yeah. And they really are. You celebrate. I, mean, I just don't want, I don't want Jews. I don't want my daughter. I don't want my, you know, my, my peers. I don't want them to feel that we need to just sit there feeling like we are always going to be these, these victims of persecution. I don't want to forget the past, but I don't want the story, Andre, that, that gets told by some in the Jewish community is we are going to be, you know, we have been and will be kind of victims of, of persecution, you know, to our to our end days. It makes it feel like it's this, this ever-present and, and will be ever-present part of us that that has stamped us. And I I I, I do think we're more that I, I don't think we can put that aside. I, I think it it has it has branded our experience of life. We can't we can't dissociate from that. But to hear so, it yeah. last weekend, my share, you shared that video with me, and yeah. I shared the the article with you about Elon Musk blaming Jews for being the problems of the world. And yeah. Jews are the reason that X, formerly known as Twitter is failing because of their, you know, the ACLU and all this liberal blah, 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 blah. And I said, we should discuss this. And I, and that's so, you know, you just brought up how some in the community, but, you know, have this, this stamp that we're going to forever be persecuted and to blame for everybody's everything. And here's this incredibly prominent man whose life biography has just been released by Walter Isaacson. I was watching the coverage this morning. Yeah. And here he is, what, what a week and a half ago saying, Jews are his biggest problem. <laughs> um, so, yeah. I mean, there seems to be something to what the community is saying. Because yeah, here we I, are over 2,000 years later, because you see I'm wearing a crucifix. Y'all, you know, 2,000 years later, Jews are still the problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we we, we had talked about this previously with, um, I think, Kanye West's comments yep. on this. Um, so I don't want to deny be ignorant you know play down the fact that this story creeps up over and over again in many ways and people try to broadcast it and gain followers for this idea that that the jews are in control of everything and are the the source of whoever's problems right all the world's problems mm -hmm. it, it that narrative clearly creeps up and again and again at the same time you know we are also accepted by way more people than we were ever accepted by when we first came up, you know, relative to when we first came over and we don't live in, you know, Nazi Germany right now. Like I'm just saying that, yes, there are narratives that keep coming back and that these narratives inspire bigoted feelings or reinforce bigoted feelings and even lead to hateful acts and hateful violence. Um, I also feel like, two things one is to focus so much on that is to ignore you know the the victor narratives right and all sorts of other parts of our identity one identity. two is it's to deny the progress that's been made in in people embracing us in people in people when they hear anti-semitism standing up and saying that ain't right you know yes, that um, ain't right. And mm -hmm. and and where that wouldn't have happened previously, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's to it it just ignores and, and it and it m kind of most important I think to parts of this conversation, it it also has people to enclose the story is to to provide a roadblock to to other people owning the story as they have you know. Mm -hmm. I want people to. To, to 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 bring it back to the to the black narrative, I do have a similar feeling to to Lowry McWhorter in that we should have we should foster a situation where it's not just black Americans feeling a strong ownership to the Harriet Tubman story. Um, and sometimes the way it can come off, and I know this is not the intention when you have the feelings you do about who should be telling that story, who sh who should have you know created this monument. 
Um, and I, and I, I, it resonates when you tell me the meaning of the story and who's delivering who, and, and, and that the person who was delivered to freedom is now creating, I mean, that that's a beautiful story, Andre. And I'm like, yes, that makes sense for this monument. So, so I want to, it's really compelling the way you told that seriously. Um, at the same time, in a bigger picture way, um, Sometimes when it's like only a black person can tell this story, um, it it creates a feeling of distance who, from people who are not black that they could actually own that story in some way. And I hear that, but that's where the trust comes in. Remember when I said that the trust acts and it's for those who want to feel like I, for those, you know, imagine someone who's non-African-American or non of African diaspora. I, they, they feel, this, this person feels a sense of movement. They feel moved by what they see or inspired. And that's where the trust act comes in. And that's when you, you, you do certain things, you say certain things and say, this is not coming. My adoration is not coming from a place of malice or mocking. This yeah. is, I'm genu genuinely moved by what I've heard and by what I've seen. And as you see, it's appropriate or as I, it makes sense. I would love to be a part of this. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think I think that that feels right to me. Uh, it feels like you're open. I feel like in this scenario. So what? So what I'm taking from you? Tell me if I got this right. I'm taking I'm taking three things. One is, one is in this you know in particular cases there is a greater symbolic story to be told when a black person is the creator of the story, and this is a particular time where it seems like there could have been something, a, a really compelling story told that fits the theme. Um, if a black person would have created that's one that's exactly what I'm saying especially since some black lines of lineage exist because of these acts yeah and two is you are open to the idea that someone can can create some sort of symbolic work of art that tells the story of black people in a compelling way but that there that there's a process of trust and the developing of an understanding of context that um that should be required and should should there should be some accountability around that um so that you don't get a lincoln monument that's like hey i'm the white savior of these you know uh, incapable <laughs> black black <laughs> slaves yeah i completely and, and that's me because like i said for, for youtubers please don't be offended i use comedy to process pain but if you were to see the statue for yourself that's exactly what the movements that i just made that's exactly what it looks I, I, like i've seen it i've seen it yeah there and you I, go. I, I will validate that um the third thing I'm I'm hearing from you is that, and this is where I have a question for you, that there is also an idea of leveraging the Black story to in increase greater representation in the arts itself. Yes. Um, Patriot. And, and I guess I would ask you, would that part of the motivation be less? Let's 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 fast forward to a hundred years from now, and you do see greater, you know, proportional representation in various fields of endeavor among Black people and others, you know, Latinos and the like, um, um, in various fields. When you feel we've reached a place of not perfect, we're never getting perfect equality. Things just move, you know up and down too much um in life but that we have a, a a much greater sense of equity across cultures that there is true that that's that 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 symbolizes that represents that there's true true equality of opportunity in a world like that where we're seeing greater equity does the motivation for providing a specific opportunity to to a black artist to kind of break through does that part of it lessen for you when we're kind of there already of course it does but what did i tell you in the first season we ain't there yet and yeah. i'll let you know once we get there okay okay <laughs> so there's that other motivation um and it just okay and, and so the optics to you not just of understanding context but the optics to you of this going to a white person then part of that optics is well you know black artists struggle so much in this area it, isn't it some is it is it perhaps in bad taste that opportunity doesn't come a, a black person's way given the inequity that exists and given the subject matter? That's that is exactly how I feel. Okay, you, so those are the three things that stick out for you in this. And I just uh, you know I want to say one last thing about this victor victimhood thing because because um, 
I think we need to do a whole show on that as a concept. Well, I had a reaction to McWhorter focusing so much because I didn't take I didn't take the criticism as being one of holding on to victimhood. I really didn't. And he took it there. And, and it made me think, you made me think when you brought up context, you know, if it was a black artist who got commissioned, you know, would they have told the story more of, of victory than victimhood? Um, I don't see victimhood in that statue. I don't, I don't know what, really face, good point. I don't, I don't know her face, what her face looked like. Maybe it was both pain and, I, I don't know what it was, so I don't want to. I don't want to put words on in in Lowry and McWhorter's mouth because I, I don't remember exactly what they said, and I, I I don't quite know what that statue gives off. But would something different have been shown? You know, it is one of courage. I mean, I think she's whole. You know, she's she's like carrying someone behind her, so you do get a sense of of courage and sacrifice. But you know, the frame could be different from a, a certain black perspective. Some might, some in the black community might prop up the victimhood or the or the pain. Some might prop up the victor, the victory, um, because there is also diversity in the black community, as you said multiple times. But, but it just makes you, it makes you at least think if the if the judges were of a certain kind, you know, of a of a of a certain thought, not of a certain kind of people, meaning black or white. If they were black, white, other, and also had different perspectives. If if the the creator was was someone who was black. Would it be depicted differently that might get that victory more across? I don't know, but but you just made me think of it in terms of context. And yeah, I think you bring up an excellent point because in the medium of sculpture or sculpture, facial expression is important because that's going to be one of the main surfaces by which you bring in the viewer, right? Yeah. Through that facial expression. And I'm I'm an aficionado of sculpture, of sculpture. Andre, what's going on with you today? Uh, and I really analyze and, and hone in on how the expressions were created, the contours of a person's face and all of that. And I think it's, 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 a, it's important to say, could those contours have been expressed differently through an African-American artist? Would they have chosen to do something different with the cheeks or with the lips or whatever, because they're Black? Uh, and to, to, to have those to have all of that integrate into a face that would achieve a different feeling than what a white artist would have created. And maybe, maybe at the same time, you know, to to kind of prop up their point of view is this sculpture had already previously resonated. There was something mm -hmm. that people liked in it, right? Mm -hmm. And so their basic point of view is this is resonating. If we wind up finding out that it was created by a white person, if it's resonating with a broad set of communities, including the black community, do we care what the source is? I know you have all your, your, your kind of the meaning and all of that. Let's put that yes. aside. But the basic yeah. point of a hundred years from now, if someone's going to look at it and we really feel like it's going to resonate with people broadly, including the black community, do we at the end of the day care, you know? Um, and, you know, Lowry asked a question, does identity driven motivations and, mo and emotions drive the creative process so much? Is it so central that, that, that again, only a black person could create something like this that in a way that resonates And what I hear you saying, let me see if I understand you is it, it matters a lot is not the only thing that matters and you can, no. you can channel this common humanity if done in the right way but at the end of the day it is still going to matter i still am going to tell my grandmother's story in a much more poignant way or maybe another jewish person who has a holocaust legacy is probably going to feel that in a particular way that doesn't preclude someone from connecting to it in a deep way but still has to be given some credence uh, as a, as yes. a factor that seems to be where you because it has a psychological impact yeah Yeah. I like, I feel good about where we've come. I feel like I completely understand this case to you, um, why it matters so much. I feel like I, I, I understand the, the economic case as well. Um, and, but I, at the same time, I also understand, I also appreciate your openness to the idea that people can translate, can feel a common humanity and translate feelings 
they've done in a way that is proactive in, in understanding context. And that- I held the memorial for a dead queen of a country. I'm not a citizen. Yeah. So yes, people can draw inspiration from shit that has nothing to do with their background. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you, have you noticed, do you empathize at all with the the react the kind of reaction that they have from this from this vantage point they being again Glenn Lowry and John McWhorter do you feel like there are at least a portion of the black community that does feel like there is a barrier to telling like a a, a hard and fast barrier to telling the black oh story? yeah totally I mean we're not some intellectual monolith right so you have as many opinions as you have many black people. <laughs> right you have some people it doesn't matter like trust me it's going to run the gamut and that's that's what society is you know and so do you, ahead, i don't sorry. envy i don't envy the job of the judges who are deciding the winning design right i don't envy that because you have a lot on your shoulders and you have to get it right especially yeah. since it's got a pretty permanent structure and yeah. people are going to know your name and talk about you for the rest of your life <laughs> kind of a thing yeah yeah. And so and 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 in in understanding that there is part that part of 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 the the black audience um of the black community can you understand I guess the way that might block certain people who are not black from feeling like they can in any way own parts of black history as their own and and therefore appreciate it in a way that that doesn't well, I think there are two considerations. So there's a there's a private ownership and then there's a public ownership. Mm -hmm. And what you privately do in your home is your business. So you want to own that in your way. That's privately in your home. When you start taking that out into the world via digital technologies or just out in the street, right? Publishing YouTube talk shows, then that's when you're open to critique. And then that's where optics matter. Because what did I tell you the other time during the cornrow conversation? P Joe Q public, Joan Q public, they don't know you. So we're going to see, look at you and see this and then assign our own intentions to it, even if we're completely wrong. That's why the optics are so important if you care how people perceive what you're trying to do. Now, if you don't get it, then fine. But I think you should because there's backlash. So when you care what people are trying to, how they perceive it, you got to get the optics right. That means you need to look at things from all perspectives. So I think where they get worried, and I can understand and empathize with this, is should should the emotions of people, let's take this group of, of people within the Black community who would have a harder, fast boundary of who could create anything related to the Black story, they're going to have their feelings, right? And should one's creative decision in this way be driven by those the, the emotions behind that group of people or at or or just consider and listen to where they're coming from and then make a decision that's a balancing act within the artist only the artist can answer I'm talking that. about I'm talking about you though like oh, when, yeah. oh, <laughs> when when we talk about the difference when when you and and I know others have you know uh Marin has brought it up Felicia has brought it up the difference between intention and impact yeah, yeah. And uh, I see for me personally, Andre, intention, impact and integrity, because you also have to you also have to give an integrity to what you're trying to create and in the way in which you are moved to own part of the story. That's what I mean, and so if if yielding toward intention and impact leads you to severely compromise integrity, it's not going to feel comfortable. Then that means it's not you. So you are gonna the artist is gonna have to balance those three those three spheres, right? Intention, impact, and integrity. Yeah. Yeah. And so while you could be sensitive to impact, you know, and this is where I feel like I could just feel like John McCorder's feelings about this of like, let's let's kind of get over the what you know, he says the eternal, you know, victimhood narrative. 
Like I'm over it. I'm happy to not bring it up. Like <laughs> I said, it's these white folks who want to feel because I would let me deliberately talk about this. Because when he said this need to feel special, I'm like, I don't the black people who are in my life and have been in my life for the near 50 years I've been on this planet have not been running around like, I feel special. We were slaves. <laughs> That's not how we feel. I think many of us are happy to move it on. But because when he said that, I because remember I said I'm a reactionary, I had to press pause. And I'm like, you need to go tell that to these white people who are like Felicia said, and Felicia's a dear friend who's a future guest on the show, by the way, yep. uh, who are clinging to what we call the construct of whiteness. You, this is the white people who want to feel special, who want to feel more than ordinary and all of that. It's their clinging to it. So they have to bring up, you know, you were black. You know, you're getting special privileges. You know, you only got into college because you're black. They're bringing all this stuff. The rest of us are happy to leave that in the past. But until they move on, we are stuck in this, e what feels like eternal, to use the parlance of some of the Jewish community, dance of you're not worthy. Why are you here? You're not worthy. Why are you here? You're not giving us rights. And it's over and over and on and on. Literally, like atoms dancing in a molecule. So a molecule of hatred. Yeah. So what you're saying is there's a certain set of conditions right now that continue to provide a, a block and, a, and a, a source of stereotypes around who black people are, um, what they've experienced that provide a block to kind of moving forward toward greater kind of equity, equality of opportunity at the very least, you know, um, um and and so it, someone like a John McWhorter is at least getting the people who feel that like you and your friends, he's getting he's getting that wrong in you continuing to harp on the so. issues, harp on the issues of race. He's not understanding the meaning or the source or the motivation of harping on it. Uh, well, he's also not holding the white participants accountable. White mm -hmm. people are participants in us having to bring up the victimhood yes. because they're putting out this energy. That's why I was saying, that's why I'm like, baby, you need to go tell that to these white folks because you're acting as though that we're just putting it out there without any triggers. There, when people walk into a Dollar General that's in a predominantly black neighborhood just to kill black people, that's called a trigger. So now we have to bring it up again. You see this dance, this dance. And all we were doing was shopping at the dollar store, literally at the Dollar General. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think that makes sense to me. And I will I will say where I resonate with what he feels because I feel I have felt it in the Jewish community. And I'm sure there are there are again. Black community is not a monolith, and I'm and I'm sure there are there are parts of the black community that do really do what I'm about to share. I've experienced uh, among Jews is there is a point in time where you know in a in a in a empathetic way, in a patient way, even I feel the need to say the past is the past. Yes, there are current, like you brought up the article, there are still people trying to spout these narratives about Jewish people, but we still live in a different world and we're not in the we're not in the Holocaust right now. And I want to say, listen, I will I will probably cry every time I tell my grandparents story. I'm not saying to get rid of your, you know, that you we got to be these like unemotional people who don't feel connection to history and to story. But I also know that I that I at least in my own in my own sense, in my own right, and for and for and for the rest of my Jewish community, I don't want to be stuck in that. I don't want us to because be stuck in people are walking into synagogues and shooting them up. You're still stuck in it. There are still synagogues and shooting them up just because you're Jewish. True, true. But there there is an importance in acknowledging the difference of degree. Right. Like I'll accept that. we're not in Egypt. We're not in Germany. These things still happen and there's still there's still threats. I'm not going to disown that, um, nor would I do it, of course, for the black community, because I'm not black, first of all. Uh, so I don't experience it. But but even in understanding some of the parallels, I, 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 I would never discount the threats that still exist. I do think that there still is validity to the 
the encouragement that I I feel John McWhorter is trying to give of don't live in that space. I feel like that's what he's trying to say. Don't live in that space. Yeah, you know, at certain points, come to remember that, you know, the way we were persecuted in Egypt, you know, C- come to remember that. Yes, but but don't have this be a a mantra that you carry around with yourself on a regular. And what basis. I'm saying is, at the same time, you go tell the bigot the same goddamn thing. Don't mm-hmm. live in the space of hatred. Don't live in the space that Jews are your problem. Fine, I accept what you're trying to say. Say it, baby. But then you go tell that motherfucker the same goddamn thing, okay. and then there we go. I, I, I agree with you there. So you feel like it's not that there's not credence to the message of let's not completely live in the past. Let's let's feel empowered in a new at a new time in a new future. But what you're saying is it feels it feels unbalanced. It feels like it lacks context. Yes. When you don't in the second breath or in the first breath say, I understand that people are still reacting because there's something that still exists. Yes. I understand. Okay. It's all right, Mr. Andre, go help you understand, babe. I tell you, I'm going to work with you. I'm yeah. going to work with you. So that, that <laughs> makes more sense to me. So that makes more sense to me. Um, now, I will I will say that, you know, John McWhorter, uh, there are plenty of times in the conversations that he has with Glenn Lowry where he does, sh- he does share empathy with the, the continued experience of, of 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 black people in America and and the way in which you know history may have you know been been at least part of although he he debates this as well um but there there is there is an empathy about the experience of black people in America that I do think he shares um but you I would know, hope but, so but, <laughs> but I but I do I do I do understand oh, that when when he says what he says, it feels very one-sided and like it la- lacks context of what co- what continues. We didn't go from from A to Z to 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 all the problems in the world, you know, r- racial problems in the world to no problems in the world, and to 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 act as if that you know the the history that Landon, who's a future guest, you know, heard where it's like you know we beat slavery with the Civil War and we beat you know um, we beat Jim Crow with. Um, and segregation with um with civil rights boom we're done right you feel like and it was only white men that did it <laughs> <laughs> you feel <laughs> right you feel like um that it almost gets across that kind of context like yes. we're we're in the promised land um that makes a lot more sense to me your reaction to to his comments there Thank you for watching this episode of Healing Race and stay with us for a scene from our next video. If you want to see more conversations like the one you just watched, please subscribe to our channel, share this video with friends and family, and like and comment on the video below. If you'd like to be a guest on one of our episodes and have an open, real conversation about race, email us at guests at healingraceshow.com. And if there are topics you think we should cover, we'd love to hear them. So please email your ideas to topics at healingraceshow.com. As always, thanks for your support. We look forward to continuing the conversation with you. Now, here's a scene from our next Healing Race. Part of the the psychology of control that whites often oppress black people with is to make them use courtesy titles with white children. Meaning you had to refer to a five-year-old as Miss Elizabeth or Mr. Steve, whatever. And this, and you are a 55-year-old black person, yeah. right? That is a thing, that is deliberate psychological control, right? Whatever you even in the most, in the smallest individual, you are not acknowledge our superiority. And, and going on the point of social norms and, and pivoting back to race that changed in the in the 1960s and 70s right where now black people who were senior were given the their courtesy titles they were referred to as miss and mr or mrs things like that yeah and it brings with it certain dignity and there were a group of people who held on to that norm like no you refer to that white child who is 50 years younger than you as miss and mr 
Yeah. And they were holding on to that. To watch the rest of that episode, go ahead and click the video below me. To see a different compelling Healing Race episode, you can click the video below me. We look forward to seeing you in the next video.